Open your Bibles with me today, please, to Psalm 138. As stated, I'm bringing part one today of what will develop, Lord willing, into a three-part message, looking at the history of God's revelation to man, the Bible, in which we'll also be looking at many Bible passages and explaining why we in this church reject all modern Bible versions and instead use exclusively as our sole authority for faith and practice the authorized version of the Bible, also known as the King James Bible. This message will, in large part, restate, expand upon, and actually also replace in our online library a two-part message I preached on this topic about four years ago, to which I really need to add some more argument, explanation, and important points of application as well, and which I believe will clarify our position and will also help to answer some important doctrinal questions that have been posed in recent discussions in our church. In Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says the Lord Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And we read in verse 2, And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered, and when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's a very important verse. We need to feed on every word of God. Jesus quoted there from Deuteronomy chapter 8, where God told the children of Israel that the reason he humbled them in the wilderness and fed them with manna from heaven was to make them know that man's most basic of needs is to know and to feed his soul and his spirit man on God's every word. His every word. However, with the so-called Bibles that most Christians use today, It is wholly impossible to know or even to be able to read every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. From the beginning of creation, the archangel that rebelled and became our Lord's arch enemy, Satan the devil, has attacked the authority and the reliability of God's word. Over the last century, he's actually greatly ramped up his attack through the publication of a plethora of new so-called Bible versions which are not, in fact, versions, but are counterfeit perversions of the Word of God, and that they all follow the intentionally corrupted Alexandrian line of Bible texts, and so therefore delete and or revise thousands of words and hundreds of verses, either via actual deletions and substitutions in the text or actually by the margin notes justifying such alterations, all of which then follows a clear, agenda to blatantly attack the person, the deity, and the atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to pervert the true gospel of Christ, among many other damnable heresies. And our position in this church is that the King James Bible is the only Bible that is commonly available for English-speaking people that correctly and faithfully translates and that thereby perfectly preserves the entire and complete canon of the Holy Scriptures that God gave to man through divine inspiration. These corrupted pseudo-Bibles or perversions include the NIV, the New International Version, the New American Standard or the NASV, the CEV, the Contemporary English Version, the ESV, English Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version or, or NRSV, the popular NLT or the New Living Translation, which is nothing but a very weak, watered-down paraphrase of the wrong text, and also the heretic Chuck Missler's International Standard Version, or the ISV, and even the so-called New King James Version, or the NKJV, among virtually every other modern translation and print. All of these so-called Bibles, these counterfeit Bibles, reject the traditional received text that the King James Bible is translated from and instead adopt as their background text an intentionally corrupted Greek New Testament text that traces its roots to Alexandria, Egypt, and the 3rd century Gnostic heretic Origen, which text then is referred to as the Alexandrian text, 
contrary to the claims of the promoters and the pushers of these counterfeit pseudo-Bibles, who say, because we don't have the original manuscripts, we cannot really know for sure what God's Word really says. That's their position. And thereby they perpetuate the satanic question, yea, hath God said. Our position is that God has promised to preserve His Word and has marvelously done so on the pages of the King James Bible. The only Bible, by the way, that's commonly available through which every English-speaking Christian can read, know, and feed his spirit man on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Our God promised us over and over in his word that he would preserve his word, and also that he would watch over it to perform it, by the way. Matthew 5, the Lord Jesus said in verse 17, "...think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets." I'm not coming to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25, For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. The word of the Lord endureth forever. We read in Psalm 119.89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And we read in Psalm 12, 6 through 7, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. The psalmist says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. That's Psalm 12, 6 through 7. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them in this generation forever. Our Lord repeatedly promised to preserve his word, and he has miraculously and faithfully done so throughout the history of the Christian church and right up to the translation of the authorized version of the scriptures in English, the King James Bible. Coming now to Psalm 138. David says in verse 2, I will worship toward thy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Then he says in verse 4, All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. We really have quite a revelation here in this verse. Throughout the Bible, we are told of the power of the majesty and of the holiness of God's name. That phrase, the name of the Lord, appears 108 times in the Bible, 87 times in the Old Testament and 21 in the New Testament. Throughout Genesis, beginning with Seth's generations uh, and the patriarchs, we read that God's people called upon the name of the Lord. In the law, we read repeatedly that the Levites and the priests were to serve and to minister and to bless people in the name of the Lord. The Lord himself appeared to Moses in Exodus 34, 5. We read there that the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. This was after Moses had asked God to reveal himself to him. And so he did that and he proclaimed the name of the Lord. Very important. Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember what? The name of the Lord our God. The name of the Lord our God. And also in the New Testament we read, of course, Paul says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the Lord himself values his name so much that he included even in the Ten Commandments, engraving in stone, that his people are not to take his holy name in vain. And the Lord will not hold him guiltless that does so, because that man will be judged. We read in Leviticus, such a man is to be put to death. And throughout the Bible, great emphasis is placed on the name of the Lord. But here, in Psalm 138, we read those marvelous words, For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And so on that basis, I would submit that without question, the written word of God is the most precious commodity on the face of the earth and the most powerful force on the face of the earth. The word of God is the only source of truth that unlocks and opens the door for man to attain eternal life. 
And therefore, there is no more valuable commodity on the face of the earth than God's word. Amen. Amen. That's why Job said in Job 23, verse 12, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. He said, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. The word of God is a powerful, supernatural book that has the power to change lives. It has the power to change your life if you're in some kind of addiction. It has the power to change your life if you're in sin. And as they say, either sin will keep you from this book or this book will keep you from sin. It's a supernatural book. And the devil knows that too. Which is why he has attacked God's word from the beginning of time. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. Before looking at several examples of the multitude of alterations and deletions that occur in the modern Bible perversion, which we will do in part 2, we need to look at the history of the Bible itself, which I'm going to focus on for today. I want to look at both the history of Satan's attack against the Bible and also of the Lord's faithfulness to preserve it. From the time that the anointed cherub named Lucifer, referred to in Revelation 12, 9, as that old serpent called the devil and Satan. From the time that he rebelled against God, saying that he would be like the Most High, and he declared warfare against God to draw both men and angels after himself, he has from that time forward focused his attack primarily against the truth and the reliability of God's Word. In recorded history, that attack began in the Garden of Eden here in Genesis chapter 3, when the very first recorded words spoken by the devil was an attack on God's word. Genesis 3, verse 1. <clears throat> now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The word yea in that verse, by the way, means truly. In other words, the devil is asking Eve, Has God truly said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. More than asking, did God really say that? The devil is actually asking Eve, was God being honest with you when he said that? Was he speaking truthfully? Did he truly say that? The question itself proposes uh, that God lied to Adam and Eve, which of course is made clear in the following verses. Verse 2, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. In other words, God lied to you, Eve. For God does know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So first, Satan questioned what God said, and then he convinced Eve that... Uh, God had lied to them, and he wasn't being honest with them. He was withholding the truth from them to hinder them from uh, being all they could be, right? To be like gods themselves, that God isn't good and doesn't want what's best for them. So by tempting Eve with the very sin that brought him down, a quest to be like God, Satan ultimately then succeeded in corrupting the entire human race, which we actually know uh, was ultimately in the unsearchable sovereign will of God before the world began, as was the cross of Christ. But from that point forward, mankind inherited a fallen nature that has a propensity towards sin. And from that very first recorded instance, Satan has continued his attack on the word of God, raising up through Cain and his descendants various forms of idolatrous false worship of false gods, and sending false prophets to Israel, causing the prophet Jeremiah to exclaim in Jeremiah 23, verse 36, Ye have perverted the words of the living God. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. The text of the Old Testament canon, the ancient Hebrew scriptures, including the first five books called the Pentateuch, or the Mosaic Law, the books of wisdom, including the Psalms, and Proverbs, the historical books, and the prophets, were all compiled by Ezra, and his scribes in about the 9th century B.C. into what we today call the Masoretic Text. After which, then, Satan continued to attack God's word so that by the time of Christ, the Masoretic Text of the Law and the Prophets had been all but replaced by the Talmudic tradition of the elders, by the Talmud. 
So we read in Matthew 15, verse 1, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah, or Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Turn next to 2 Peter chapter 3. So before the cross and long before Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jews driven from the land in AD 70, the Jews had already actually replaced the law of God with the traditions and the doctrines of men instead. The Satan's attack on God's word certainly did not end there or even let up. In fact, he ramped up his attack with the advent of the new covenant in Christ's blood. As you read, uh, the apostles... We're turning the world upside down in the first century with the good news and the promise of the gospel of Christ. The devil at every turn attempted to corrupt the gospel and the New Testament doctrine with error, with idolatry, and various forms of heresy. We know the letters of Paul to the churches were accepted very early on by the churches as scripture, as the inspired and authoritative word of God, which, by the way, the apostle Peter confirmed who said, even as those scriptures were being written, that they were being twisted by an unstable man. He said in 2 Peter chapter 3, Even as our beloved brother Paul, also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, Peter said, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, he said, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So Peter there acknowledges that, in 2 Peter 3, that Paul's epistles were scripture. Paul himself warned repeatedly of such attacks on God's word. He said in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. In Acts chapter 20, Paul warned the Ephesian elders to be on guard against the heresies that the devil's crowd would bring in to the church saying, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Paul said, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn Everyone, night and day with tears. So Satan attacked the word of God. In the earliest days, the church had to combat various heresies that have arisen. First, we know the heresy of the Judaizers arose. Uh, These were those who taught that Christianity was simply a perfected sect of Judaism and that Gentiles must first convert to Judaism and keep the law before they could be saved. This was the heresy that was actually most strongly Uh, refuted by the Apostle Paul. And actually refuting that heresy is a major theme of Romans and Colossians, Galatians and Hebrews as well. The next heresy that made its way into the church uh, was that of Gnosticism, a belief system that arose in Hellenistic Greek culture that emphasized a worship of spiritual knowledge itself. They worship knowledge itself, and they believe that the physical world is itself corrupted and evil, But that evil could be transcended through acquisition of esoteric or hidden spiritual knowledge. That's what the Gnostics believed. As this belief system made its way into the early church, it produced the heresy that because the physical world is itself evil, therefore the Lord Jesus Christ could not have been a fleshly human being. And the Apostle John countered this heresy in 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. The Gnostics denied that. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, wherever ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So John is here 
condemning the Gnostic heresy that Christ could not have come in the flesh. Another heresy that came in was Nicolaitanism. Another early heresy that arose in the churches in the first century, confronted by the Lord Jesus himself, actually, in his letter uh, through John to the seven churches of Asia, as a doctrine that he hates. He said in Revelation 2, verse 6, But this thou hast, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. At the same time, he rebuked the church at Pergamos, because they allowed it. He said in Revelation 2, 14, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. He said, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, Jesus said, or else I will come unto thee quickly. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Jesus hated that doctrine. What was that? From the word Nicolaitanism itself, which is taken from two Greek words meaning rulers of the people, or rulers of the laity, as the Catholic and Protestants refer to. The heresy of the Nicolaitans was an attempt to create an office of special rulers or priests in the church to stand between God and man just as the Old Testament priests had done, and also as religious priests in Babylonian false religions also of Greece and Rome had done. This heresy, of course, never died out, remains today. In Roman Catholicism and Protestant churches, many other heresies arose in the early church. When Jesus calmed the Sea of Galilee in the midst of the storm, uh, the disciples asked, what manner of man is this? Even the wind and the seas obey him. What manner of man is this? In the same manner, many Christological heresies arose early on about the person of Christ and what manner of man he was. One of these early heresies was, the, was that of doceticism. Doceticism, that's D-O-C-E-T-I-C-I-S-M, doceticism. This was a variation of Gnosticism that denied Christ's humanity, saying that he appeared as human but was exclusively divine. In the second century there arose the heresy of the Ebionites, Ebionism, that denied the genuine deity of Christ and that said Jesus was not pre-existent and that he became the Christ after his baptism. That, by the way, is still promoted by many heretics today. Another heresy that arose early on was the Nestorian heresy, that of Nestorius, which denied the unity of Christ's person. He said that Christ was, in fact, two separate persons, as humanity was separate from but controlled by his deity. And uh, we recently, of course, covered modalism also, or Sabellianism, which is the heresy that denied the Trinity by teaching that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are not separate persons, but are instead one person that exists, that executes three offices within the Godhead. And as stated then, that heresy is still held to today by many so-called oneness Pentecostals. Another heresy that arose was that of Arianism, A-R-I-A-N-ism. This was a heresy that was popularized in the late 200s and early 300s by Arius, who was an elder of the Alexandrian church. This heresy was also held to by Origen. And this heresy also denied the genuine deity of Christ and said that Christ was the first and highest created being. This heresy was refuted later on by Athanasius and was condemned at Constantine's Council of Nicaea. But it survives today in the heresies of the JWs and others. Various heresies reached a crescendo and actually a crisis stage in the heretical 3rd and 4th century school of Alexandria, Egypt and especially through the work of that school's Gnostic heretic, Origen, spelled O-R-I-G-E-N. This man was very rightly and fittingly named, since he really is the origin or the source of the perverted text that underlies the modern perverted Bibles, the counterfeits. Origen Adamantius was born to Christian parents in Alexandria, Egypt, in about 185 A.D., and later assumed leadership of the college at Alexandria uh, from its founder, Clement of Alexandria, after he adopted many of Clement's uh, perverted views of theology. Origen became a powerful orator and a very intellectual theologian, but he adopted several heretical doctrines that were actually a blend of Gnosticism, Platonism, Greek thought, and Christianity, 
for which he was later branded a heretic at the Council of Constantinople. Uh, but his most notable deviant teachings include the following. Horizon taught that man was inherently divine. He believed in a form of reincarnation and included both the pre-existence of souls and also transmigration, uh, or that at death the soul passes into another body. And he described the Trinity as a hierarchy, not as, as an equality of Father, Son, and Spirit. He believed in baptismal regeneration and in purgatory. He taught a universal salvation. Everyone, including the devil, would eventually be saved after they go through purgatory. He believed that Christ was a created being and became God at his baptism. And he taught, based on Matthew 19, that a true man of God should be castrated, which tradition or legend says he did to himself. And he developed and promoted a spiritualized view of the scriptures as allegory and metaphor that took very little of the Bible literally. As such, he denied a literal interpretation of the Genesis creation. He taught that it was a myth, and he taught that there was no actual person named Adam. Horizon is venerated today by Catholics and by Bible-detracting liberal apostates as a respectable theologian. Uh, but this man was actually arguably one of the most villainous Bible corruptors in history. Horizon was, in fact, the father of the more uh, recent textual criticism movement, or what we should call the Bible alteration and corruption movement, really having himself attacked the writings of the Apostle Paul as being non-authoritative and non-scriptural. Horizon was well known for his intense labor to produce a corrected version of the Greek New Testament in which he deliberately altered the writings of the apostles to suit his rejection of Christ's deity and to insert his twisted blend of pagan doctrines and Gnosticism and Platonism and mysticism into the Christian faith. Much has been written about this man, Origen, and his atrocities. One article states as follows regarding Origen. Now, what manner of man was Origen? He's described by Mosheim, who was an 18th century Lutheran uh, church historian, as a compound of contraries, wise and unwise, the patron of superstition, the corrupter of Christianity, and the one to whom the Bible suffered much. As the controversialist, this article says he was wholly unscrupulous. His reputation as the great introducer of mysticism, allegory, and Neoplatonism in the Christian church is too well known to need recital, he writes. Those who are best acquainted with the history of Christian opinion know best that Origen was the great corrupter and the source, or at least earliest channel, of nearly all the speculative errors which plagued the church in after ages. The quote goes on. He was strictly a rationalist. He disbelieved in the full inspiration and infallibility of the scriptures. His philosophy was that of Ammonius, who asserted a common religion in all the schemes of philosophy, including the Bible. The keynote of all Origen's labors was uh, the effort to reconcile Christianity and this eclectic pagan philosophy into a substantial unity. That's what Origen did, tried to blend it all together. That the mere words are accordingly of no importance. He expressly denied the consubstantial unity of the persons and the proper incarnation of the Godhead, the Trinity, denied the Trinity, etc., etc. Uh, another theologian named R.L. Dabney, who was a well-known 19th century Presbyterian pastor, he had much to say about Horizon as well, including this excerpt from an article that was published in the Southern Presbyterian Review of April 1871. He said, The commentaries of Origen, which abound in quotations drawn from heretical revisals of Scripture, the facilities of correcting this text from Origen's writings and the blind reverence in which the ancient father was held in the school of Caesarea seem to have rendered the corruption of this text unavoidable. There appears a strong pro probability then that the learned Origen is least of all entitled to, to that authority which the recent critics claim for him as a witness to the state of the genuine readings. But that if the whole truth could be recovered, he would be found from uh, the original corrupter of the text, writes Dabney, back in 1871. Another man who you should know about is John Bergen. There's a society named after him today, King James Bible Society, John Bergen Society. He was a 19th century champion, actually, and, and defender of the King James Version and of the Texas Receptus. 
and he authored scores of scholarly books on the transmission and the corruption <clears throat> of the original Greek manuscripts. He said this of Origen, I'm of the opinion that such deprivations of the text as found in Aleph and B, the two Alexandrian texts, were in the first instance intentional. Origen may be regarded as a prime offender, the author of all the mischief. Clement used hopelessly corrupt versions of the New Testament which there is in these last days an attempt to revive and palm off on an unlearned generation the old exploded errors. This is in the 1800s he's writing this. He went on to say, We are assured without a particle of hesitation that Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus manuscripts are of the most scandalously corrupt copies extant. They exhibit the most shamefully mutilated texts which are anywhere to be met with and have become the depositories of the largest amount of fabricated readings, ancient blunders, an intentional perversion of truth, which are discoverable in any known copies of the Word of God. That's, those are pretty strong words. John Bergen. Many more quotes we could give. I'm not going to do that, but <clears throat> Origen, as I said, is well known for his uh, work in compiling what is known as the Hexapla, produced around 240 A.D. and preserved today only in fragments. Origen's Hexapla was a critical compilation of the Old Testament Hebrew, Bible in six versions, assembled in columns, six columns, in which each column contained a variant reading or a different version of the Old Testament scriptures, four of them translated into Greek, the fifth column of which actually is referred to by many today as the Greek Septuagint, alleged by many to have been compiled in the 2nd and 3rd centuries B.C. by 70 Hebrew elders assembled from the 12 tribes of Israel, but that's actually impossible. That legend appears actually to be a hoax. As in truth, Origen appears to also be the originator of the Septuagint, which was in fact non-existent at the time of Christ. So those who say that Christ uh, and the, the apostles quoted from the Septuagint, not true. That version appeared for the first time in Origen's Hexapla. There's no other archaeological evidence of that ever existing anywhere. The first time it turns up is in the Hexapla. So then, just as the blind lead the blind into a ditch, Origen's work had a huge impact on an admiring student at the Alexandrian school named Eusebius of Caesarea, well-known church historian, who after Origen's death was commissioned in 331 AD by Emperor Constantine to produce 50 copies of the Bible in Greek, and who did so following Origen's ravaged versions of the scriptures the reason Constantine chose Eusebius for the work was because he was trying to unite the empire and he needed an ecumenical Bible that would appeal to all, much like the NIV that we have today, by the way, and that Constantine could then use to try to unite the empire in a common universal or Catholic religion. Great uh, one of those 50 Bibles that Eusebius produced for Constantine was actually uh, mysteriously discovered in the Vatican Library in Rome in 1483, just in time, by the way, for the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation, that text is known as Codex Vaticanus. Codex Vaticanus, or Codex B. No doubt, one of the oldest and best preserved of all ancient manuscripts, and one of the most heretical. Amen. Having been reproduced by Eusebius on very expensive parchment, made from calf skin, which is why it survived. And it, didn't, of course, didn't undergo the daily use, like the copies of the pure apostolic manuscripts transmitted by God's elect in the true churches, whose manuscripts, therefore, didn't last very long. So while this text, Vaticanus, referred to in the modern perversions as the oldest and most reliable manuscripts, is certainly one of the oldest in the manuscripts. It's certainly not the most reliable. They may be older, but they are not reliable. And when a different Constantine named uh, Constantine von Tischendorf then discovered the Sinaiticus text, which was another one of those 50 Bibles, in the 19th century, he believed it to be one of those 50 Bibles, along with Codex Vaticanus, which contains similar corruptions, but also contains some differences in organization and division of the books. We'll come back to that. So this is the ancient history of what we refer to as the Alexandrian text. That's where it came from. From which the modern perversions of the, or the pseudo-Bibles 
are all derived. They all come from that perverted Alexandrian text. It is these Alexandrian texts that two British spiritualists, Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort, followed when they allegedly spent 27 years producing their fabrication, fabrication titled the New Testament in the original Greek, they titled it, which we today refer to as the Westcott and Hort Greek text. I'll come back uh, to that more modern history momentarily. Uh, but while the devil's agents and operatives were busy assailing and corrupting the scriptures, God was all along faithfully preserving his word just as he promised he would do, Amen. using his elect remnant through all ages who contended for the faith once delivered for the saints uh, through severe persecution from the first century of the church onward, from ancient Christian groups such as the Montanists in the second century in the region of uh, Phrygia, one of whom was a great defender of the faith named Tertullian, and uh, to the Donatists and the Novatians, the Paulicians, to the Albigenses and the Waldenses, all of whom, though they did have differences in some areas of doctrine, still held to the body of fundamental and indispensable apostolic doctrines that we today do call the Baptist distinctive doctrines, including and especially the doctrine of the sole authority of the scriptures for faith and practice, they didn't submit to the Pope of Rome, including also separation of church and state. They didn't believe that the state should that the church should control the state. And they also believed in the autonomy of the local church versus any authority of any universal church. They didn't hold any any universal church. And all of whom, by the way, also faithfully transcribed, preserved, translated, and disseminated accurate copies of the apostolic scriptures throughout the Roman Empire, many times at great risk to their own lives. In the year 1516, just one year before Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church at Wittenberg, and leading to that same event, those texts were compiled and printed by a faithful Catholic scholar named Desiderius Erasmus, commonly known simply as Erasmus, who was a Catholic scholar. He compiled those ancient texts into a Greek New Testament text that we know today as a Textus Receptus, also known as a received text. Uh, Erasmus loved God's word, and he rejected an appointment by the Pope as a bishop to instead focus his life's work on the compilation of the New Testament text. He was actually a closet reformer who later in life came out of the closet and was branded a heretic by the Roman Catholic Church. He later died in the company, actually, of his Protestant friends who protected him from the agents of the Vatican Inquisition. The reliability of the Textus Receptus, Erasmus's text, from which the King James Bible was translated, is based on the premise that as New Testament manuscripts were copied by hand and spread throughout Asia Minor and Europe from the first century AD onward, that the majority of those copies would be reliable and that errors would only occur in very few of the copies. And hence, that compilation of text was re is referred to as the majority text. And the, that presumption, by the way, is borne out uh, in the fact that where the King, wherever the King James Bible differs from the modern perversions, the King James Bible's readings are confirmed by thousands of scriptural quotes from the writings of early church leaders, such as Tertullian, Hippolytus, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, and others, dating back to the first century in the church at Antioch. So, following Erasmus's printing of the received text, various translations were produced, including Luther's Bible in 1522 in German, the Geneva Bible, produced by John Calvin and his associates in 1560, the Bishop's Bible, which was commissioned by Queen Elizabeth uh, in 1568, and then in January 1604, King James I of England convened the Hampton Court Conference where a new English version of the Bible was commissioned to resolve perceived problems of the earlier translations, such as the bishops and the, and the Geneva Bibles, as such problems had been perceived by the Puritans, which was a powerful faction of the Church of England, and by the way, from whom the King James translators were chosen. King James commissioned a committee of around 50 Greek and Hebrew scholars, 54 by one report, from the Church of England, who aligned with the Puritans, who rejected the Alexandrian text that was 
available to them via the Latin Vulgate, and they worked primarily from Erasmus's Texas Receptus. They took seven years to faithfully and painstakingly translate those Greek and the, the Greek New Testament text and the Hebrew Masoretic Old Testament into English. Their product, the authorized version, also known as the King James Bible, released in the year 1611, had been, until the 20th century, the universal standard for Bible-believing Christians of the English-speaking world. And so as God promised to preserve his word, he has done so through the text from which the King James Bible was finally faithfully translated. So back now to the devil's attack. The so-called higher criticism movement attacking the Texas Receptus and Protestant translations was, of course, instigated by the Jesuits immediately following their early formation in 1534. But then in the mid-19th century, that movement really bore its fruit, as it seems the devil was actually unleashed about that time to launch his most vicious attack against the Word of God. Resuming that part of the history then, it's Constantine von Tischendorf discovered what's called Codex Sinaiticus in 1844, actually in the waste bin of a monastery at the foot of what was thought to be Mount Sinai. This, again, is the Alexandrian text developed by Eusebius and his predecessor, Origen, heretics. Uh, Then the devil raised up two British spiritualists named Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort, both of whom were closet Catholics, spiritualists who made their way into the Anglican priesthood and into teaching positions at Cambridge University and who, posing as Bible scholars, produced a Greek text now known as the Westcott and Hort Greek text, which was based on Origen's two remaining Alexandrian texts, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Neither Westcott nor Hort were true believers in Christ. Both men denied the inerrancy and the literal interpretation of Scripture. Both preferred actually Catholic doctrine and no doubt had ties to Jesuits. We actually know quite a bit about the attitudes of these two scoundrels from their biographies about each one, actually written each one by their respective sons. Their sons each wrote biographies about them. Uh, The Life and Letters of Fenton J.A. Hort by his son, A.F. Hort, was published in 1896. And similarly, The Life and Letters of Brooke Foss Westcott, written by his son, A. Westcott, was published in 1903. There are many, many quotes that have been documented showing that these two were in no way Christian. They were basically implements and tools of the devil, and that their aim all along was to attack the Word of God. I'll give you just a few quotes to drive that point home. As for their Roman Catholic loyalties, Hort called evangelical doctrine perverted. And he wrote uh, to Westcott that Protestantism is only parenthetical and temporary. In 1846, Hort wrote the following. Still we dare not forsake the sacraments, or God will forsake us. He said, I am a staunch sacerdotalist. In other words, staunch sacerdotalist, by the way, being a reference to the Roman Catholic priesthood and sacraments, which Hort believed are necessary to salvation. We dare not forsake the sacraments, or else God will forsake us, he said. In 1847, Hort said, After leaving the monastery, we shaped our course to a little oratory, uh, which we discovered on the summit of a neighboring hill, a very small one with kneeling place, and behind a screen was a pieta, which is a statue, big statue of Mary with her son Jesus after he's crucified. Pieta. The size of life I could not help thinking on the fallen grandeur of the Romish church fallen grandeur of the Romish church before the Reformation, on her zeal even in error, on her earnestness and self-devotion, which we might, with, noble, with nobler views and a purer end, strive to imitate. Speaking very highly of the Roman Catholic Church. He said, had I been alone, I could have knelt there for hours. The guy's a Roman Catholic. Westcott also wrote that the face of the Virgin is unspeakably beautiful. I looked till the lips seemed to tremble with intensity of feeling. Doesn't like a Catholic to you? That sounds like a Roman Catholic to me. Yeah. As to their attitude toward the scriptures themselves, neither of the, these two scoundrels took the accounts of the miracles in the Bible or the creation account literally. And nowhere in their extensive writings 
do Westcott or Hort ever defend or teach the inspiration and preservation of God's word? In 1846, Westcott wrote to Hort, I never read an account of a miracle, meaning in scripture, but I seem instinctively to feel its improbability and discover some want of evidence in the account of it. He also wrote, No one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis give a literal history. I could never understand how anyone reading from them with open eyes could think they did. This is their approach to the scriptures. These are the two that modern Christianity looks to as their authority. Hort similarly wrote, I am inclined to think that no such state as Eden, I mean the popular notion, ever existed, and that Adam's fall in no degree different from the fall of each of his descendants. As to his own spiritual condition, Hort wrote this in 1848, But that simple faith and obedience which so many enjoy, I fear will never be mine. That's what Hort said. In 1849, he said, The fact is, I do not see how God's justice can be satisfied without every man suffering in his own person the full penalty for his sins. Then why did Jesus go to the cross? These are the heretics that Christians look to today for their authority. Westcott wrote, My faith is still wavering. I cannot determine how much we must believe, how much, in fact, is necessarily required of a member of the church. How much do I have to believe to be a Christian? Westcott says. So he doesn't know if he's a Christian or not. Little wonder of that, uh, since it's also been revealed how both of these two men actually dabbled in the occult, in the occultic British spiritualist movement, and it's an investigation of ghosts and devils. Uh, On this subject, Hort wrote as follows. Westcott, Gorham, C.B., Scott, Benson, Bradshaw, Luard, etc., and I have started a society for the investigation of ghosts and all supernatural appearances and effects being all disposed to believe that such things really exist and not to be discriminated from hoaxes and mere subjective delusions, we shall be happy to obtain any good accounts well authenticated with names. Westcott is drawing up a schedule of questions. A cope calls us the cock and bull club. Our own temporary name is the ghostly guild. This was a group of men, uh, the ghostly guild. This was a group of men from Cambridge who formed this, uh, this society, the ghostly guild. So these two heretics... Look to today as theologians, alleged, Bible, alleged Cambridge Bible scholars who were in league with the devil himself and who despised the Texas Receptus, underlying the King James Bible, much like Origen in the third century, and using Origen's Alexandrian text as a springboard and as their pattern, set out to produce a so-called corrected New Testament Greek text, and thus they produced what's known today as the Westcott and Hort text which then, again, became the basis for the Nestle Alant, or the critical text that underlies all modern so-called Bible versions, which in those modern versions is cited as the NU uh, text in many of those, referred to in all of the modern Bible perversions, including the New King James Version, as the more reliable text, their oldest and most reliable manuscripts, that they say. So the final result of Origen's work and that of Eusebius, Westcott, and Hort, all of whom allowed themselves to be used as tools of the devil, is an abominable and truly satanic perversion of God's word that, as we'll see more in part two, deletes thousands of words and hundreds of phrases from God's word with an obvious and blatant agenda to attack the person, the deity, and the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ and to pervert the true gospel of Christ, among many other damnable heresies that we'll be looking at in more detail uh, next time. So then, while over the last century of great apostasy, there has been an explosion of various so-called Bible versions with hundreds of copyrighted translations into the English language alone, Mm -hmm. the choice to make regarding which Bible to use is not at all between those hundreds of translations. The choice is only between those two sources of text upon which the translation is based. There are only two sources, each of which represent two entirely different approaches to scriptures. The received text or the majority text or the Byzantine text that traces its origins to the apostolic church at Antioch, faithfully preserved by God himself as he promised, wherein the translators believed in verbal inspiration, word-for-word inspiration of the scriptures, 
They believe that all men are liars and cannot be trusted. And they understood that there is a, a satanic attack on the scriptures themselves. To the contrary, there is the Alexandrian or Westcott and Hort text produced through the villainous efforts of Origen, Westcott, and Hort, taken from Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, that traces its roots back to the liberal school of heretics at the School of Alexandria, in which the translators did not believe in verbal translation. They believed that man is capable of correcting God's word and are either oblivious to the satanic influence in the attack, or, as in the case of Westcott and Hort, I believe they were intentionally joined in league with the devil to implement that attack. Of all the ancient manuscripts, and there are about 5,300 fragments of manuscripts, 95% of those agree with the Textus Receptus. The texts that agree are in harmony, and they're, they're longer texts, they're simpler reading than the Alexandrian counterparts. The traditional text, actually, we know, was in use all over Europe Asia and North Africa, whereas the Alexandrian text was only used in Egypt. The traditional text had been translated into a variety of languages, whereas until the 19th century, the Alexandrian text was not translated into any other language. And of the quotation of early church, the quotations of early church leaders, we have 87,000 quotations to the scriptures from the early church writers, the majority of which are from the traditional text which was accepted and received by God's people for 15,000 years, the vast majority, 95%. But the Alexandrian text was never used until the 19th century. There are over 2,000 historic and ancient manuscripts in existence made specifically for church readings and for, for liturgy. All are taken from the traditional text. And as for deviations in the Alexandrian text from the, from the Textus Receptus, which we'll look at in more detail next time, Sinaiticus text removes 4,000 words from the Gospels alone. 4,000 words. It adds 1,000 words and changes readings in 1,500 places. That's Sinaiticus. It also underwent multiple corrections of multiple mistakes by three, three editors. Vaticanus text uh, left out 1,000 sentences, added 500 words, and 2,000 times moves words. Traditional text, on the other hand, was accepted and received by God's people for almost 1,500 years before the Westcott and Hort text came along. The Westcott and Hort text was never used, obviously, until the 19th century. And so the promoters of, and pushers of the corrupted Bibles would have us believe that for almost 1,500 years, or until Vaticanus was found, the Lord's churches did not have an accurate text of the Bible to use. But then suddenly, in 1483, when Vaticanus was found in the Vatican Library of all places, we now have the true scriptures. So these same promoters of the modern corrupted Bibles would have us believe that it was the false, counterfeit Roman Catholic Church, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, that faithfully preserved the New Testament scriptures. I don't think so. I don't think so. So that's going to just about do it for today for part one. I wanted to give you the history. The next time we'll come back and look at the actual deletions and changes made in the text of those modern perversions. We'll also look at the doctrines of inspiration, preservation, and translation of the scriptures, and also exposition of the scriptures that are all critical to this issue. Now for today, the sum of the matter is this. God has promised to preserve his word and has marvelously done so. Psalm 12, verse 6 through 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, Purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them in this generation forever. In spite of Satan's tireless efforts and the myriad of wicked men he has raised up to work his ceaseless attacks on God's word, God has preserved his word through the ages. Amen. Using his elect remnant from ancient separatist Christian groups I mentioned before, the Montanists, the Waldenses, Paulicians, and the Anabaptists, and others throughout history to faithfully preserve and copy and transmit God's New Testament word to preserve it as it was written in the autographs by the apostles. So that a faithful former Catholic theologian, closet reformer, turned true reformer named Erasmus could compile and print those texts into what we have today as a received text or Textus Receptus. And so that then a devout group 
uh, 54 of the finest and most faithful and brilliant language scholars ever assembled can be commissioned by uh, King James I of England to provide a faithful translation of the entire Bible into the English language, which we then have preserved for us today in the King James Bible. And the King James Bible is the only Bible commonly available today in the English language that faithfully follows and accurately translates the ancient manuscripts of the true scriptures as they were compiled by Erasmus into the received text. And aside from the King James Bible, every single modern translation available in the English language comes from the corrupted Alexandrian line of text. Every one of them. And either by addition or deletion, each such perversion or counterfeit Bible repeats thousands of times over and over the ancient lie of the devil that God didn't really say that, now did he? Yea, hath God said. He didn't really say that, did he, Eve? And that includes, by the way, the New King James Version. That hundreds of times throughout its pages, it says in its margin notes, that the text as printed cannot be trusted. That the so-called older and more reliable text, meaning the Alexandrian text, say thus and so, or don't have this verse in there. Thereby doing nothing but casting doubt on the entire Bible itself, repeating over and over the satanic question, yea, hath God said? Did God really say that? And so, in conclusion, please turn to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. God takes his word very seriously. As pointed out from Psalm 138, verse 2, God has even magnified his word above his name. We know that Jude says that we are to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. That means that we are to contend and to fight wholeheartedly for the word of God as it was delivered to the apostles. God says, one of my favorite verses here, God says in Isaiah 66 verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and what? Trembleth at my word. Do you tremble at God's word? Does it mean that much to you? God is looking for a people, he says here, that tremble at his word who fear God and who earnestly desire to know what God says so they can be obedient to His will. That's what it means to tremble at God's Word. Those who tremble at God's Word are those who cling to every word of the Lord, who will not allow God's Word to be messed with, who deem every word of God to be more precious and more necessary than their daily food, as Job said. And personally, I cannot imagine Now, any born-again believer who looks honestly at the facts of history and these corruptions of the text can in any way say this is not an important issue. I can't see it. If you are one of those that perhaps thinks this is a non-issue or not at all important, apparently you are not one of those who tremble at God's word. As for me, I'd rather be one of those that God looks to. He looks to those that tremble at his word. I may be poor, maybe you have a contrite spirit, but God looks to those who tremble at his, and who love his word. God's word is the, by far, most valuable commodity on the face of the earth. Right. And the most powerful. Amen. What are you doing with it? If you have stopped reading your Bible, you need to repent. You need to open God's word and you need to read it. Every day. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you so much for this precious commodity, for your word. What would we do without your word, Lord? It is our life. We thank you, Lord God, that you put your word down in black and white for us to read, to study, to know that we can know you. You didn't leave us here to grope and wander about and wonder how to find you. We thank you so much, Lord God, for this precious word of God. Help us, Lord, to read it, to ingest it, to digest it, Lord, to to learn it, to love it. In Jesus' name we do pray.
Amen.